Good morning. Welcome to our service virtually today um, for October 25th. I can't believe we're already almost done with October here. Um, I hope that uh, this Sunday morning finds you doing well and uh, healthy and uh, excited about sharing some thoughts with you today and some music with you today and and uh, my desire is to be a help and encouragement to you in your walk with uh, Christ and and uh, I'm hoping that uh, next Sunday we can be back together and uh, we'll see what the numbers in Knox County do and and uh, kind of adjust from there so look for an announcement about that um, here sometime throughout the week all right so um, we're going to start with a song that we're familiar with that we've sung several times, uh, Behold Our God. And I picked this song out just to remind us of the fact that that God is God. Um, and, and the thoughts I'm going to share with you today, that's an important point and one that I think is, is lost today. We'll talk about why that is. Um, but I think it's a really important point for we as believers to keep in the forefront of our mind that God's on his throne. Um, now that means some great things uh, as far as we're concerned about uh, peace during troubling times, um, about just having that comfort that he's in control, that he's a sovereign God. But it also means that because he is God, we owe him our allegiance, our obedience, our, um, our love, and we need to look at it as though his commands, his word given to us is truth. And he is the basis of truth. And so as we uh, sing this song, I hope you'll sing along with it, that you'll, you'll see that, you'll rem be reminded of that. Um, that he is that great God seated on his throne. And uh, let's rejoice in that today. in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to Jesus 
today before we uh, go to prayer. Um, we do want to pray for Priscilla. She is battling COVID right now and, and we want to pray for her. Lord, we just lift her up and uh, give her uh, complete healing from that and just protect her through that. Also, uh, Larry's brother is uh, battling COVID right now as well and uh, so we want to be praying for him. Um, uh, right now he's in a nursing home and, and uh, so we just want to lift him up. We also want to pray for Dave uh, Benham. Um, Dave's going to be, he's got a growth in his bladder. It's going to be having um, surgery in December. And uh, again, a second surgery in December to make sure they got all of the growth the first time and, and uh, just to determine the, the game plan for here. Um, it is cancerous. And, and so we want to lift up Dave. Uh, we've been praying for Greg Harger. Um, he did have a surgery. And, and uh, so um, for his skin graft, uh, just pray that that would heal up and no, be no complications for that. Um, we also want to play for, pray for Teresa Schurler. I mentioned that last Sunday. Um, I haven't heard an update from Rob yet, but uh, there's some sort of lymph node abnormality going on. And uh, so just lift her up today and, and pray that uh, nothing would be um, going on with that, anything further. Um, all right, and continue to pray for the uh, Denise's dad. Um, he is in a rehab place now. Uh, the fear has been again and again that he gets moved there too quickly and then he's not quite ready for it physically and uh, so be praying for him as he's in that rehab place that he would in fact uh, be doing doing okay and uh, so I want to pray to that end all right um, so remember those things in prayer and and uh, this week and our missionary of the week is Melissa uh, Carlson in Sweden and pray for her ministry and uh, as they and during this COVID time and trying to figure out how to do ministry is challenging anywhere you are, um, including Sweden. And uh, so we, especially as you're trying to start a new ministry as they are. And so that's really a challenge. So be praying for uh, Melissa and her team um, as they uh, work on that and try to interact with uh, folks and uh, bring the gospel to Sweden. All right. I am happy to report that Tammy and I are doing pretty well. And, and uh, we actually start back to school tomorrow. And so appreciate prayer. We'll have some students that are still under quarantine, and um, we're hopeful that things will continue to go well, and uh, that we will be able to um, uh, kind of get through this. And uh, so appreciate prayer for that as well. And um, 
where we just continue to protect us through the challenging time. This really is our first major hit in Knox County and, and uh, so we expect it to be a little rough here for a, a while. And uh, so protect yourselves, watch, uh, care for yourselves and uh, plenty of vitamin C and vitamin D and zinc is what I hear is the best thing to do. And so we pray and, and work into that end that you uh, can stay healthy. All right. And pray for Bex that her due date is, is this week, uh, sometime middle of the week, I believe. And so be praying for her um, that she would deliver that little girl and everything would be healthy and, and uh, uh, that everything would go well with that. All right. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's pray here. Lord, we just thank you that you love us. We thank you for your care for us. We thank you that you're uh, concerned about our concerns and our cares. And we think of the those that are um, battling COVID right now. We uh, think of Priscilla and just uh, protect her. We pray that Richard wouldn't uh, um, get it as well, but uh, that you protect Priscilla and help her to continue to heal and that she wouldn't have to go to the hospital and uh, just help her to um, recover quickly here. Um, we also pray for Lyle and Larry's brother and watch over him and care for him and, and uh, work through that. Uh, Lord, we do uh, pray that he would heal up. Lord, we pray for Megan's dad, um, who's in a nursing home now after a, a, a toe amputation, and we pray, or I think, or at least a surgery. We just pray that you would um, help him as he recovers and um, just uh, protect him from uh, COVID that's going around so many nursing homes and and uh, we know that's a, a real challenge. We pray for Greg Harger and his surgery uh, for his skin graft. We're thankful that that happened, but we now pray for healing and uh, that you would just uh, uh, provide this to heal up and, and not to have any other issues at all and uh, just watch over him through that. We pray for Denise's dad. We know that's been a challenge and um, over the last several months and uh, just provide healing there and help the nursing home now or the rehab place to be able to really give him care and help him get back up on his feet. Um, we pray for the Robs as they're helping Jordan move uh, um, this week and we pray that that would go well, that his move from Florida to Arkansas would, would be smooth and um, that he gets settled in there and ready for his next round of training uh, for the Air Force and, and uh, just help him through that. Uh, Lord, we do uh, pray for Melissa and her ministry in um, Sweden. We pray that you give um, her just a um, new ways to minister to folks there and, and new opportunities um, through this challenging time and help her. And um, We lift her up before you today. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that uh, um, you're a God who cares for our cares and our concerns and our uncertainties. We know Roy and Teresa are going through some uncertain times right now with uh, the doctor saying there's just something going on with her lymph nodes. We pray that they would be able to figure that out and uh, heal her up and uh, just watch over her. Lord, we pray that you give us a great service today. Help me as I share some thoughts that they would be your thoughts and based on your word and uh, that they would be helpful and help us grasp uh, kind of why we are where we are today, and, and uh, Lord, help us to uh, defend the truth and defend the faith, and uh, we pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, sing another song here, He Will Hold Me Fast, and what a good reminder that, that God's got us, and uh, we're secure in Him, and uh, so I hope you'll enjoy this song, He Will Hold Me Fast. Would be 
Scripture reading today is Psalm 119, verse 73 through 80, a very appropriate psalm as we think of um, abortion and, and uh, what God's view of abortion is. Um, so 73 starts, your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the insolent be put to shame, because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. Uh, what a great uh, psalm here again, and, and uh, we'll look forward to studying that together on Wednesday night. And uh, we'll do that via Zoom this Wednesday, and uh, I look forward to that. Or at least I think we will look for an announcement on that one. We'll see what the numbers are looking like in Knox County and make that decision. So. All right, so I look forward to uh, digging into that uh, here soon uh, on Wednesday and, and uh, together. All right, one last song here before I share some thoughts. Uh, Rejoice, the Lord is King. You see a theme here. We're, we're, we're looking to God as the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's who he is. Um, he is the, um, he is God. And uh, let's submit to him, even in our thinking, uh, this morning.
so I want to share some thoughts today of, of the biblical response to abortion. My desire is to hopefully help you um, see God's view of, of this, what I think is a horrible thing that's going on around us. And obviously that's going to give away what I think the Bible says. Um, but I don't want you to think that this is a, a political um, I'm not asking anybody to turn from the Democrats to become a Republican. That's what, what I'm asking you to do. But what I am asking you to do is to think about this issue of abortion biblically and to remove your political leanings from thinking about abortion. It should be that we place our understanding of God and His Word above our political party that's how it should be and if it's not i think you should question whether or not um, you're standing there what do you find to be more important and so i hope you'll think about that uh, number two I, oh, here's here's the reason why i i have uh, decided that i really want to talk about this uh, a few reasons number one um, i assigned um, my sixth graders, I teach a sixth grade grammar class, and I assigned them a writing assignment that was given to us from uh, the Knox County Right to Life. And, and I, after some feedback from parents, a few parents, that I realized that a lot of sixth graders don't know anything about abortion or even what abortion is. And I'm not saying that sixth graders uh, should know that, but as I was thinking about that, and that my first response was, what, sixth graders don't know about abortion? How can they not know about abortion with how much it is talked about today and accepted today, and how is that possible? But then I also thought about the fact that, and it, my initial response was, well, why aren't churches talking about it? And then I realized I haven't talked about it very much at all. And so it was a understanding, a, a grasp that, you know what, this is something that we do need to talk about that we do need to open up God's Word and says, what does God's Word say? And so that that's part of my reasoning for um, looking at this. And another reason is I was um, recording for Reverend Bob for, he, he was a keynote speaker last week uh, for the Right to Life a Festival of Life, which, by the way, if you haven't watched that, I encourage you to. Uh, we've heard some of the things that he said, especially some of the jokes. Uh, we've heard those things before, uh, but he did a great job of, of sharing um, just the importance of believers being involved and uh, in some way. And he, he definitely understood that. Not everyone's going to be involved in the same way, but we should all be involved in some way. And I thought that was an important point that he made. And so I encourage you to watch that. It's on the Right to Life uh, uh, Facebook page. I also shared it to the Concerned Christians of America, uh, that website page or that Facebook page, so you can find it there as well. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, it also... I was reminded of the importance of this as I was watching the um, hearing uh, for Judge Amy Coney Barrett. And I was reminded of the, the thinking that comes into play um, with abortion and how much of an issue it still is today. And, and the thinking that kind of leads to that. And uh, it reminded me that we really do need to look at things uh, in a biblical way and, uh, and search that out. And so I began the sermon preparation for this a few weeks ago now, um, thinking it would just be a quick sermon that went through talking about abortion and God's view of it, and we moved on. Uh, but as I, I began to read articles um, written by Christians who are advocates of abortion, and I'll, I'll read part of that article, part of one of those articles uh, at the end of my sermon today. But as I did that, I realized that this thinking is deeper than just abortion. The thinking that leads to being an advocate as a believer that abortion's okay is much deeper than just the issue of abortion. This is not a political thing. This is honestly a truth issue. And because of this, I really want to spend a couple weeks uh, to think through this with you and um, today will likely be more in depth than you want me to go. <laughs> I'm not to say in abortion. We're not going to actually talk about abortion very much at all today. Um, but on doctrine and truth and even some history. 
um, we'll go deeper and understand how we got to this point in our country uh, and the world. And I hope this will be helpful to you. Um, I hope that as uh, we think through these, any issue in general, that we can learn from this, uh, this thought. Okay? A popular bumper sticker uh, reads, Don't like abortion, don't have one. And that's the idea of some people today. You don't want an abortion, don't have one. What's the big deal? But notice what that bumper sticker does. Instead of kind of refuting the essential pro-life argument, it changes the subject. And it's a very important change. It treats the pro-life's moral claim that abortion is wrong because abortion is murder as a mere preference. Abortion is about likes and dislikes. It's about what you feel about it. That's, in my opinion, intellectually dishonest. Morality is about what's right and what's wrong, not about what we prefer, not what we like. You know, try it in this, in this mindset. Don't like slavery, don't own a slave. Now, if, if someone was to say that today, what would that, obviously they would be, you know, they would be in a lot of trouble. Anyone who would say that doesn't understand the nature of moral reasoning. Nevertheless, people kind of want it both ways. They condemn abortion with words and say, well, I wouldn't do that. But they want it to be legally available. They say things like, I personally oppose abortion, but I don't want to impose my beliefs on someone else who disagrees. So then the question comes is, why do you disagree with abortion then? Why is it that you would not get an abortion? So you as a believer, why would you not get an abortion? Why would you not want your child to get an abortion? If abortion does not intentionally kill an, an innocent human being, why would we be opposed by that? Or opposed to that? Now we'll dive into that argument more next week, but... For now, think about that. If you don't want your belief in what is moral and what is not based on absolutes, what are we left with? You know, if I, if I was to say, well, I personally oppose spousal abuse, but I don't want to oppose my personal beliefs on you. After all, your moral beliefs are just as valid as my own. If I, if I said that, you would say, well, wait a minute. That's not neutral on spousal abuse because you're just giving someone else permission to do it. You'd say my moral compass is broken and you'd be right. Obviously, there are some morals. This is an important point. Obviously, there are some morals that our society imposes on others. Right? That can't be questioned. Because it happens. So where does those, where do those morals come from? And so if we believe that there are some morals that are imposed on other people, because there is some sort of set of morals out there, the question comes, where do those come from? And therefore, if we believe that, moral neutrality on an issue like abortion is impossible. You as a believer can't say, honestly, you shouldn't be able to say, well, I wouldn't get an abortion because I believe it's wrong, but I'm not going to impose that on somebody else. No, you can't say that. Well, you can, but you, it doesn't logically follow. That's a sign that you are following your political party rather than your morality, rather than admitting that there are morals. And really what you're doing is uh, espousing relativism, a worldview that says that right and wrong are either up to the individual or his or her society. Not any objective truth. Now think about that. If morality is up to you as an individual and you have your morals and I have more my morals and there are no absolutes, think about what that does to our society. If you even believe that a society can determine what is moral, 
that it's a, a group think, and as long as the major part of the group thinks that something is moral or immoral, that's all that really matters, we're also in a world of hurt. I would argue, by the way, that's where we are today. So, relativism, um, moral, in relativism, morality is like almost like choosing your own favorite flavor of ice cream. It's strictly a matter of what you personally prefer. That's all that really matters. Well, relativism is not actually neutral. Relativists think that they're right and non-relatives are wrong. And so therefore, by logical reasoning, they're espousing that there is an absolute, that there are none. By the way, it's a Supreme Court justice that said that uh, back in the 50s of all times. So if not, this is what's interesting, why do they correct non-relatives when ar who argue that moral truth is real and knowable? They argue and say, no, you can't know that because we said that no, it's not knowable. It's all relative. So even if your view is that all truth is relative, all truth is up to the person who espouses it, that is the truth that you're holding to. The lack of absolutes is actually an absolute. Now, all of this, this is what's interesting. Here's a little history lesson. And stay with me, all right? I know I'm, I'm talking a lot of philosophical things and logical reasoning and now history, but stay with me because there's a point to it. Um, hist historians have labeled, uh, you know, periods of, of time in history with different labels, the prehistoric age, the ancient area, the, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, those are just a few of those, describing certain periods of history. But modernism is another period. Um, it was coined actually in 1907, but it, it refers to the 1700s to the middle of the 1900s. The exact dates are a little sketchy there, but uh, it's somewhere in that range. And modernism is kind of the a cultural outlook that puts its faith in progress, the pursuit of knowledge, uh, scientific investigation. Basically, the idea is they have faith in logic, in the belief that knowledge can be gained through our senses and in science. Uh, J.I. Pa Packer summed it up with this. He said, modernism assumed that it was in the power of reason to solve all the world's problems and to determine what anybody needed to know. So basically, knowledge is power. You can figure it out. And by the way, that led to uh, really the Industrial Revolution and everything that happened in the, uh, to get us to where we are today. Um, basically, uh, their thought was nothing is true until science proves it to be true. So there was a lot of science advancements. I'm teaching chemistry right now, which, whew, that's a challenge. Pray for me. <laughs> but as I'm teaching chemistry, I, I guess I've never paid attention before when I was taking chemistry in high school and college, of just how much chemistry advanced in the early 1900s, of how little we knew about even the atom until the 1930s, how little we knew about the periodic table of elements until that time, because we didn't even understand protons and neutrons and electrons. I'm not going to get into the whole science lesson, but it is interesting to me that those advancements came during the early 1900s. That's not that long ago. Uh, so it's pretty amazing. So modernists, you know, they give us the scientific method, the uh, hypothesis, experimentation, observation, conclusions, all these things. They kind of did a lot of logical thinking to figure things out. But modernism teaches that human beings have within their own power the ability to rationally discover all truth, apply those truths to moral and ethical situations, and kind of just go about life. Now, we know that in historical periods, whenever you get down with a historical period, there's usually a response to it. And generally, the response is kind of a counter to that. <laughs> we see that again and again through history. So what was came after modernism? Well, postmodernism. In the postmodernism era, most people say some, somewhere between the 50s and the 80s. That's a big, big stretch. Um, but somewhere in there, uh, we had this reaction to modernism, a turn away from object, objective truth in science towards personal subjective truth. And you can see postmodernism all over the world. 
You see it on TV and museum, muse, movies, the children's classrooms and song lyrics on the news. Postmodernism teaches that reality is in the mind of the thinker. Reality is what I'm thinking. And therefore, your reality may be different than my reality. One doesn't discover truth by looking at life around you. Instead, one discovers truth within himself. Science and technology are not able to answer all questions or fix the problems. Instead, they're just helping us so that we get to that point where we can think of the solutions. That we can just make up whatever our reality is. Truth is very personal. Truth is very subjective. And our view of truth and not understanding of knowledge is conditioned by what we are. Which is conditioned by the society and culture within which we have grown up and lived. That's why you can have one set of truths for one society and another set of truths for another society. And that's completely okay. And a key proponent is that it's impossible to know anything for certain. And their view of religion is, you know, religion is fine and okay and whatever, as long as you don't say that it's absolute truth or a universal truth that applies to everybody. As soon as you say that, you have crossed the line and that's not okay. So re religion... Um, kind of should reject the, the rational thought and instead have a more mystical, non-doctrinal experience. And think about where we are today with churches. Isn't that what sums it up? It's about what you feel. It's about what that passage means to you. It's about God speaking to you. It doesn't really matter what the Bible says. That's an old historic book. It's more about... What I think, what I believe. Folks, this is how cults start. This is why we have lost our way as the church. It is. So they even would say that you can take your theological differences and kind of create your own religion. Think about all the different religions that are out there today. Some of the mystical type combinations of, of Eastern mysticism and western religion and kind of meld them up together and make its own little thing think about that so in in this postmodern world which by the way isn't a isn't a good statement anymore it's, it's kind of rejected that phrase but it is where we are but judgment and intolerance are the ultimate evils. No one can say that anyone else's behavior, philosophy, religion is wrong. Uh, to suggest that anyone is wrong is insulting the height in the height of, a, of a arrogance. Of course, it's totally acceptable to suggest that someone is wrong if they believe in absolute truths. So again, the only absolute is that there's no absolutes. As soon as you declare that what you, that what you have is an understanding of truth and that other people need to hear it, that's where you're wrong. Morality is up to the individual. Develop your own morality based on discussion and investigation rather than simply accepting the morality of our society. Reject religious heritage, religious tradition, religious calls for absolute truth. And so they would understand that the, the dangerous people are those who assert that their ideas are better than other ideas if those ideas include absolutes. Those who make exclusive claims are the enemy. So, truth, truth is relative. They depend upon one's culture with regards as truth, and everything is a matter of perspective and personal opinion. All truth, as someone said, is like Play-Doh. You can make anything you want with it. So think about how that plays out in our society today. How many times have you heard the phrase, I just have to speak my truth? 
every time that statement is said, I oh, it should make your your head turn and go, what? My truth? Is that what truth is? Your truth? I have my truth. You have your truth. We just go with it. But folks, that's where we are today. In this age of writing being acceptable, changing the definition of words. Uh, that was insane, by the way. This Read about that. Um, what is or what is not offensive at the drop of a hat. All of it really shows that this type of thinking have an, having an effect on our society for the past 70 years. Now the question is, does that thought line up with God's Word? If there are no absolutes, then nothing can be judged as wrong. Without absolutes, nothing can be deemed right. There's no absolute standards for right and wrong. How can you say mass shootings are wrong? How can you say racism is wrong? How can you say adultery is right or wrong? How can you say child abuse is wrong? How can you say abortion is wrong? You can't. But there are absolutes. We do know these things are wrong. The reason we know these things are wrong because there's a standard for right and wrong. For example, the laws of mathematics and physics and chemistry are, are not relative, they're absolutes. Now, some of those things that we learn in science, we're still learning. People have made a lot of bad models, but once we get an absolute law, it's always true. And that's when it becomes not a theory, but a law. And so those become foundational. And in the same way, we accept that there are certain things that are, in fact, right. The reality of the real world proves truth and absolutes exist because there are things that we stand firm on. And here's an important point. People who deny absolutes are simply suppressing the truth that they fundamentally know. That's what the Bible teaches. Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous, unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. God has made it plain that he is God and he sets the rules. God has written that on the heart of man. God has shown that to man. And if someone says that there are no absolutes, they are suppressing the truth that God has given them. Folks, that's what the Bible says. That's not what Republicans say. That's not what Democrats say. That's not what Libertarians say. That's what the Bible says. The great creator, the God of the Bible, is the source and definer of truth. It is impossible to define truth without reference to God. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, a creator of the universe, claimed to know, or not just to know truth, but to be truth. What did he say? That familiar verse, John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if we believe that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, believed in absolutes. He believed that truth exists. He wanted his followers to know the truth, and he said, know me, know the truth. According to Jesus, he wants his followers to know the truth. 
John 8, chapter 30, or John chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we believe, I believe, that the moral law of the great creator, our great God, given to us in the Bible, is the standard for right and wrong. This is the authoritative standard for morality given to us by our great God. And he imprinted that standard on each human heart. It is not, it is a non-relative absolute. It's not what you think, it's what God says. Romans 2, verse 15 says, They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. God's given to us an understanding of what is right and wrong. And you can see that in a child. When they do wrong, they hide from it. They know it. God's given that to us. And folks, that's such an important point. We know right from wrong because of God. It's not because our society tells us those things. It's because God has given it to us. The moral law of God is the standard. That's why humans instinctively know that, that murder, theft, all of it is wrong. Morality and absolutes are not a matter of personal opinion. Whether that's the opinion of the chief justice, the opinion of the president, or the opinion of any private citizen, or any group of private citizens, that's not where it comes from. It comes from God. Folks, following personal opinion instead of God's absolute truths leads to death. What does he say in Proverbs 14, 12? There's a, say, a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. When we start trying to figure things out apart from God, it's what leads us to death. So that's my first point. God is the standard setter, not man. My second point is this, and I know this has been a long time just to get to my, my points here, but I think that introduction is important. My second point is this. Satan is a liar who from the beginning has questioned the absolute truth. Deny that. What do we read? Let's read it again. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the women, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, you, We may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the free fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat it, Eat of it, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. God had already declared to them what was good, what was evil. God told them that. Folks, that's an important point. Satan lied to them. Satan questioned truth. Think about that. Satan is a liar who questions God's absolute truth truth. That's what he is. Now, I'm going to read a passage from John and, and just listen to this. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham, and he's talking to the Pharisees here, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth and I heard that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. 
Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the word of God. The reason you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Do you hear that interaction there? It's all about truth. Right before this is the well-known passage that, said, that where Christ says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The religious leaders tried to claim that they were Abraham's offspring. They were not slaves anyone. They didn't need to be set free, they say. First off, what a laughable statement. They were literally in bondage to Rome. But Christ showed them that, that this passage, uh, through this passage, that they did not want to hear the truth because of their father, the devil. Notice the description that Christ makes of Satan. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and a father of lies. Folks, relativism, that idea that truth is what you make it, you have your truth, I have my truth, that is an idolatrous lie because what it does is it sets up man as a sovereign arbiter of truth of what will be truth for him it makes me my own god it removes every external objective standard especially the word the truths that god has revealed in his word Listen to what John MacArthur says about this. He says, truth cannot be adequately explained, recognized, understood, or defined without God as the source. Since he alone is eternal and self-existent, and he alone is the creator of all else, he is the fountain of all truth. If you don't believe that, try defining truth without reference to God. See how quickly it completely crumbles. The moment you begin to ponder the essence of truth, you're brought face to face with the requirement of universal, absolute, the eternal reality of God. Conversely, the whole concept of truth instantly becomes nonsense, and every imagination of the human heart therefore turns to sheer foolishness as soon as people attempt to remove the thought of God from their minds. And folks, that's where we are today. As a society, we've removed God. Our thinking has become nonsensical. As a society, I'm not talking about mine, I hope anyway, founded on God's word. Now when we put this all into the concept of the context of abortion, what do we get? Well, we'll get into this part next week, where I will argue based on the absolute truth of God's Word. Frankly, if you do not believe in the absolute truth of the Word of God, I'm not sure that I can convince you of anything. I'll be honest with you. If you don't believe what we read in God's Word is the truth of God, and it's truth for everyone, not just those who believe it, but true for everyone, I don't know what to do. And I would argue, as we read in Romans 2, if you're willing to reject the truth of God's word concerning truth, you rejected God himself. That's what I'm reading. God's word, his truth, and his message for us are so closely related that to deny one is to deny Christ and what he's done for us. Then what do we have? Now, I want to put these things in the context that, we, that we're talking about this morning. 
I read that article. I mentioned at the beginning. I read an article a few weeks ago that was an interview of a progressive pastor who is an advocate for abortion. She firmly believes that there is a Christian theological argument in favor of abortion. And I want to read part of this article because I think it, it all sums this up neatly and, and helps us understand how it is and where we go wrong if we believe that God's word and a theological argument can be made to kill an innocent baby. Notice what she says here. I'm just going to read this argument, uh, this interview. It's an interview, so we have some of the uh, uh, interviewees um, questions, and then we'll read the arguments. He's, but first, the lady says, this woman pastor says, I believe that every person I encounter, including myself, has the right to their body. When that bodily autonomy is taken away, to me, that is against Christian scripture and is against the gospel I believe in. So the interviewer asked her this. She says, so just to be clear, why do you think this, uh, what do you think is the Christian theological argument for abortion? And notice what she says. When people talk about our body as a temple of God and holy, I see that as I have the right to choices over my body and the freedom to make decisions that are right for me. In Genesis, it says that God breathed God's spirit into our lives. Christians would say the Holy Spirit. Because of that, we're not puppets controlled by God. Because of the image of God in us, we have freedom. That's what's really clear to me is freedom. There's a little passage in the Gospel of John that continues to stay with me. Jesus says, I have come that they may, ha, might have life and have it abundantly. The Greek word that's used there for life abundance is this word zoe, which means not just that you're living and breathing, but that God's plan for our lives is to actually have a meaningful life with loving contentment and satisfaction. Because of that, because I value life, and I believe Jesus values life, I value the choices that give us the type of life that we need. The interviewer continues and asks her this question. I often speak to people in what you might call a gray space on abortion. They might say something like, I believe it's a legal right to a safe and accessible abortion, but on a personal one-on-one -on -one level, I believe in encouraging people to choose to carry pregnancies to term. Would you say that perspective resonates with you, especially in those pastoral counseling contexts? This pastor answers and says, no. I still think encouraging someone to carry a fetus and give birth to a baby might not be the most life-giving decision. The interviewer asks, do you think there's any context in which it's immoral to have an abortion? She answers, I don't. I really don't. I don't think I do. For me, it's a health care issue. The best person to make that decision is the person who has to decide that. And if that person believes it's immoral for them, then I would have to honor the conscience of that person, person and walk with them through what they would choose. Now think about what she said there. It's all about what the person believes. If you believe it's immoral for you, then I'll walk alongside you. But I would never encourage someone to give life to their baby. Because it's not life-giving. Think about that for a minute. But I would argue that this is the logical end, the only logical end, if a believer is okay with abortion, this is your thinking, whether or not you come to that conclusion. If you go to that extent, if, if, if you try to say, well, I, I, I'm not for it for myself or my family, but, you know, I want everyone else to be able to choose. Well, again, if it's about whatever we think, whatever we believe, that there are no absolutes. This is where we come up with. Folks, we do not base our morality on what we believe ourselves. 
If that is the case, our entire world would be an absolute mess. Like it is. Because we as the church have decided that we are going to stray away and not teach that this is absolute truth. When we get to that point where we're willing to just say whatever, you believe what you believe, I'll believe what I believe, it's all good. We're lost. And in this area of abortion, that's where we're at. I'm going to hopefully prove that to you next week and show you from God's Word that this is not how God thinks about abortion, but instead God sees life being killed. Life that he gave being killed. Come back next week as we talk about that. But please understand that God is the source of absolute truth. Is your worldview philosophically and logically consistent with that statement? If not, why? If it is, then my question is this. How can you uphold our great creator, our great creator God, the, the one true God, how can you uphold his truth in your sphere of influence? How can you celebrate the fact that he is God? He is truth. I find great comfort to know that he is truth. It makes sense of everything that we do. If you don't have that, you're missing out. Let's pray. Lord, help us to think biblically. Help us to have our thinking lined up with your word. Help us to see you as the absolute authority, truth. Lord, help our thinking to be lined up with your word. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. I know that was a deep sermon. I know that was a lot of uh, philosophical and historical thinking, but I hope it was a help to you, and I hope it's something that we can build on for next week. All right? Have a great afternoon.